China is like to me like an anchor for world history because it starts way back in the ancient river valley civilizations. Do we need to review Paleolithic and Neolithic man? If we do, we'll do that like the very last day. So, a civilization has happened. We are now living in cities. We've got the eight factors of civilization. We live in a city. We've got job specialization. We've got social classes. We've got monumental architecture. We've got a complex um, religion. Um, we have a society. The first four of those, as we know, are Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, and China. Well, China's will start way back here, right around 1650 BC. So we are deep into period one. And, and this is about the most intensive. I do everything in bullet points during review, so this is going to be um, like it. Um, China is living in the Yellow River Valley, and it's named uh, you know, Yellow from the Low West. And they're going to form a civilization at this time that will remain, for the most part, unchanged up until the early 1900s, as I told you, a sun yet sun. Um, so from 1650 to 1027 BC, we have the first the foundational of 31 Chinese dynasties. Last one ending in the early 1900s, 1905, 1906. And so here we start um, a dynasty, which is a family who is in power for a length of time. And the first Chinese emperor is who? You. Yu. Yu is the guy who goes out and he digs those ditches for 13 years. He's not afraid to roll up his sleeves, get out there, and do hard work. And he demonstrates the three um, deep Chinese trade, traits, dedication to duty, family, and hard work. And as such, the Chinese gods will reach down and they will bless you and make him the first emperor of China. Because the Yellow River, known as the River of Sorrows, because it flooded all the time. The people couldn't make good dams and, and, and dikes with the, with the low S, so it flooded until you came along. And they said, that's the guy that we want to lead our people. And so, the Chinese at this time are going to become farmers, and they are going to grow wheat. That's W-H-E-A-T. And that is how they will remain for a long time. And they're going to sit in one area in north-central China for centuries. And at this time, the Shang Dynasty will become militarily powerful. And they will seek to block an ancient invader known as the Xiongnu or the Mongols. The Mongols are from the northern part of, you know, north of China in Mongolia. And they will hate each other for a very, very, very long time. Because the Chinese are so far removed from everybody else. I mean, India is kind of close, but... It, there's the Himalayan mountains um, in between. Mesopotamia and Egypt are on the other side of Asia. The Chinese believe that they were literally the center of the universe. They felt the gods chose them. Because they literally did not see anybody for thousands of years. They were isolated. So they began to believe in... Chinese ethnocentrism. We are literally the center of the universe. Another thing that pops up at this time is just like everybody else, you, want, you know, that chart, whatever you want to do, is they become deeply polytheistic. And they worshipped the gods of nature. God of the wind, God of the rain, God of the sun. Um, those were their powerful entities. But they added something a little unique, and I liken this to like Roman Catholics praying to saints, a little concept known as ancestor worship. And ancestor worship 
work like this. I need like some sort of, of help. So I pray to my deceased ancestors. They are closer to the ear of the Lord of heaven. So they can help you out. Come on in. But you can't ask for anything greedy. You can't ask for like to win the lottery or have someone fall in love with me. It's got to be, so can we help the harvest to grow? Can we protect the village from invaders? Things of that nature. It begins to grow at this time. Technology that is invented way back um, 1650 to 1000 BC, the Chinese come up with the concept of the wheel. But it's only one single wheel that they will have a wheelbarrow. All right? Anybody ever use one of those? Like a big bucket with two handles on it, you move like dirt and mulch. It's like, what? It's what we hire you know, people to do. All right? Well, it's a way to carry a heavy load. So the wheel is invented. The Chinese will come up with the invention that will be the namesake of one of the greatest trade routes in history. Many of you put it as your number one thing in our bracket, the Silk Road. Well, silk is this very soft fabric that can used as, be used as an insulator. It can keep you very warm. But you can dye it very bright, vibrant colors, yellows and blues and paints and purples, and it doesn't fade. It becomes a highly sought after item on the trade routes, and the Chinese are very adept at working with bronze, bronze metalwork. A lot of people are still using wood and stone and bone, iron, and then bronze comes along, or um, more prevalently in every other society besides iron. And the focus in China is always on the family. So that's where we all are up to um, 1027. Everybody good? Yes. Next dynasty that comes along. Mm -hmm. Oh, double five plugs it in. That would be the problem. Next dynasty that comes along is um, the Zhao or the Chao dynasty. Now the Zhao and the Chao are kind of like an early version of like the Aztecs and like the Seljuks were in Ottoman Turkey and in Mexico. The Zhao or Chao family were the warrior arm for the Shang Dynasty. And they do all the heavy lifting, they get rid of all the bad guys, they, they do all the dirty work. And in 1027, they take over from the Shang, and here's where it gets weird. Because if the Shang are blessed by the gods, and the emperor is now worshipped as a living god, how do you overthrow a god without transforming the entire society? How do you, that's what our religion is built upon, how do you get rid of a god king? Well, they come up with a thing known as the Mandate of Heaven. And the Mandate of Heaven is that cycle that I told you about. Well, you gets out there and he works really hard and he digs those ditches. And his son does it. And probably his grandson does it. By the time you get to great-great-grandson, all the hard work is, is done. So now all you have to do is go out there and maintain it, right? You know, okay, that's working pretty good. So you go out every week, then it's every two weeks, and then it's every month. And progressively, the kids get lazier and lazier and lazier. So by the end, they're spoiled rotten brats. All right? They're charging heavy taxes for their luxuries. They want an Xbox One. They want a PlayStation 7. They want an iPhone 10. They want this. They want that. And they don't work for it. Well, it's at that point that the gods get angry and they remove the mandate of heaven from them. The gods no longer bless you. And there's got to be a period of punishment for the people. A period of plague, period of violence, famine, you name it. And out of that chaos, someone will emerge. Sometimes a military general or a peasant that will right the ship and say, people, this is what we've got to do. Let me roll up my sleeves, get out there in the field, and work. 
and they will kickstart the cycle all over again. Is this starting to sound familiar, guys? All right, so we got this, right? Speed okay, a little faster, a little slower? Good, all right. And so the Zhao Chao will be the second dynasty. And what they do, what the Chinese are noted for, is tradition. Well, let's look at what the Shang did. Let's find out what worked, and let's just simply keep on doing it. Then we're going to modify, and we're going to make it a little better. And they come up with probably, probably, excuse me, the earliest known form of feudalism, where the king, the emperor, is in charge. But I can't be everywhere. So I'm going to distribute land to a lot of people. I'm going to have peasants work for it. And I'm going to send out trusted people to keep an eye on it for me. Xavier back there. Phoebe and Sierra. John and Anna Grace. Alexi. And they are going to govern that territory for me. But if you're in third period, you will know that can I trust Xavier back there in the corner? Man, Xavier just does his stuff. But if I just break this plane of the room any at all, who starts acting like knuckleheads? John and Noah. So i got to start coming over here. And as I get over here, John and Noah begin to behave. But all of a sudden, what does Xavier do? He starts screwing around, or maybe it's Phoebe and Sierra. Maybe Sierra just starts singing out of nowhere. And we're like, Sierra, what are you doing? And then I walk back here, and she starts being quiet. But all of a sudden, Alexi, who is never quiet, keeps talking even more than ever. So China realizes that its size, while an asset, is also a negative. Because no matter where the emperor is, he can't be everywhere. So i got to trust these guys. Problem is, you know what? I really don't like to work out there in the field. So a large gap begins to grow between rich and poor. Xavier, Phoebe, and Sierra, Alexi, and John are living well. They're the boss in the big house, the lord of the manor, while the peasants are literally living in like mud huts in the ground. So there is a large gap between, nowhere in the ancient world is the gap between rich and poor bigger than in ancient China. So the Zhao or Chao are going to last for about 800 years. I have a drinking problem. Some dynasties last a long time, some do not. The next one um, is going to be the quickest ever. We experienced the Warring States era after the Zhao Chao dynasty, about a 350 year period of just pure and absolute chaos. We break into different regions. John Land over there, Alexiville, um, you know, Xavieropolis, whatever. And China is not unified, it's just a, a, a round robin tournament. A massive um, Grant Reed MMA king of the cage, right? Last man standing wins. That's what we've got to have. In this er era, different Chinese states begin to develop a governmental bureaucracy. We are going to get people to do a specific job. Tax collectors, judges, uh, you know, people to make decisions to help us Govern so things can stabilize. And the Warring States era, it just basically, like it sucks, right? So we want to restore order to chaos. Who likes and runs on order? Who really likes chain of commands? Zach? It's the Chen Dynasty. Yes, and military. Guys, how many times have you heard me say it? General, Colonel, Major, Captain, First Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant. Next up comes the shortest dynasty of all time, the Qin Dynasty. Remember, we remember it because sometimes when you get really hard, you take it on the chin. All right, you get hit in the chin in the King of the Cage, New York MMA style. So, Qin Dynasty 
It's going to last for barely 20 years. It was short-lived. And it is at this time that they come up with the concept of legalism. And legalism is that swift, violent punishment. People are bad. You are all evil, greedy, corrupt, selfish beings. Thomas Hobbes was going to be right a couple thousand years from now. So you guys need to be told what to do. And if you do something good like PBIS, I will give you a rich, lavish reward just for doing the minimal allowed. And if you are bad, I'm going to punish you swiftly and severely. Remember the kid in Singapore? That was Keynes. That is the Qin Dynasty. And the big king there is Shi Wang Di. Shi Wang Di will unify once again China to restore order to chaos. And he builds a massively centralized government. He is an absolute monarch. I am going to tell you what to do, and by God, you are going to do it. But he goes a little too crazy. Again, people need to adjust to change. Rapid change isn't going to work, but if you let them grow into it, they'll say, well, it's kind of like always been this way. A couple years ago, we were all shocked when they moved that greenhouse down here around the curve, and they cut down all those trees, and now there's yellow townhouses there. Well, now, we're, do we even remember that plot of land before there were the townhouses? Some of us do, but like, yeah, yeah, like barely, like what? It was just two or three years ago. We're accustomed to it. We now know what it, it is like. Um, but he tries to make everything uniform. Everything had to be the same. Like roadways had to be maintained. The axle lengths on carts had to be the same. So there were only two ruts from the wheels. Um, weights and measures, everything had to cost the same. Society, there was no, it was very rigid. Right? Everything looked the same. Everything was the same. And that's okay for a while to maintain order, but every, then you got to kind of like back off, let the people breathe a little bit. But he didn't, and the people were terrified, and every day they did something wrong, they were punished. It was like Katniss you know, um, being terrified of President Snow all the time. Well, a couple good things that Shi Wang Di does is, number one, he imposes a uniform written language. The Chinese are going to speak different languages, but they are all going to write the same. So no matter where you're from, north, south, east, west, Mandarin, Cantonese, will find a way to communicate. He also has built one of the greatest architectural wonders of the world, the Great Wall of China. All the separate pieces of the Great Wall are connected into one massive big one. And he built something that I think is rather cool, the, the Terracotta Warriors, the army protecting his tomb in the capital of Xi'an. However, he changes too quickly. He gets out of control and people don't like it. Another thing he does is he busts out his copy of How to Be a Dictator for Dummies. As a matter of fact, he writes it. And he burns all the works of literature that disagree with his philosophy. Only three philosophies remain. Number one is the great philosophies of the warrior Sun Tzu. That's number one. Number two was a guy named Mencius. And Mencius was like, people are good, just let them be good, they'll be happy. And they were probably going to burn that one, they just never got around to it. And last but not least, is something that, that Shi Wang Di liked, and those were the sayings of Confucius. Confucius was around in the 500s, and Confucius validated the mandate of heaven. He also sets up that chain of command, filial piety, right? emperor to subject, father to son, older brother to younger brother, husband to wife, and friend to friend. And if everybody does what they're supposed to do, we'll have this giant unbroken chain from the emperor down to the poorest peasant. So that becomes official Chinese philosophy in the Qin Dynasty. But man... 
God, people just hate being yelled at all the time. So they quickly rebel. All right. So all of that stuff that we have just talked about. Um, the Qin Dynasty, all right, um, 200s BC. Think of that simultaneous um, with um, uh, the early parts of, um, like, connected to, like, Greece and Rome in the European world. Um, with the uh, Mayora Empire in the um, Indian world. This is all period one stuff where pretty much everybody is doing roughly the same thing. The Zhao Chao Dynasty, think of that as ancient Mycenae, like the Trojan War, um, is as close as you're going to come to that. So we're moving now into classical history, one of the great hallmark dynasties in all of um, China in world history, the Han Dynasty. And the Han will be a contemporary of ancient Rome. It is during the Han Dynasty that there was a regional trade route coming out of Korea and moving through China will burst beyond China and begin to eke its way over to India and Central Asia. It is known as the Silk Road, where we're going to trade silk, we're going to trade porcelain, we're going to trade horses for things like spices, um, for information, for religion, for iron. So the Silk Road comes during the Han Dynasty. Now, the main emperor is a guy named Han Wu Ti. Han Wu Ti comes to power when he's just 16 years old. And he was a warrior. And he sets the standard that all great Chinese dynasties from this point on have got to expand the borders of China. And Shi Wang Di said that I don't want to look at the past. I don't want to know what the Zhao and the Chao and the Shang Dynasty did. I don't care. That happened in the past. And the Han Dynasty said, no, that is information that we can use. Their guidelines, their blueprints, those are things that can help us. So what he did is he had his scholars try and rewrite all the books that the um, Qin Dynasty burned down. And he extends the borders to the Kriyas, to Mongolia, and that became like a hallmark. That's what you have to do to be a big Chinese dynasty. And this is where Confucius will not only be validated, but it's the first time that in China, the civil service exam is going to, you guys doing okay? It's been like 20 minutes. You guys are like, let's see, you guys are like, I'm just going to keep rolling. You know, when you guys tap out, let me know. The civil service exam is set up. The Han Dynasty wanted men of ability to run the government. So you had to take a test. You were trained. You were taught what to do. And then you took a test. But remember... It wasn't just the test. Sydney passes the test, but she needs somebody to give her a recommendation. So I give Sydney the recommendation, but if Sydney screws up, not only does she lose her job, but I lose mine. That way it's not a good old boy network. You just can't look out for your buddy's kids. And you've got to really believe that Sydney can do a good job. From the Silk Road, we get the idea of Buddhism that comes out of India and is transferred to China, and it attaches itself very well with the concept of Confucianism. And it is at this time that the Confucian scholars will get into an argument with the last few remaining legalists called the Salt and the Iron Debates. The emperor throughout the Han Dynasty had monopolies on products that everybody wanted. Salt, copper, um, iron, 
and liquor. If you needed one of those things, you had to go to the emperor. And throughout China, the group of people we don't like the most are the merchants. They're necessary. And they do a lot of hard work. But they make money off of other people's labor. So no matter how hard it is, you're really just trading stuff and selling it, things that other people made. So merchants are frowned upon. And the Confucian scholars say, hey, wait a minute. If the emperor has a monopoly, then he's no better than a low, dirty, scum-sucking merchant. So he should not have monopolies. The legalists say, oh, he's the emperor, he can do whatever he wants. Confucian scholars are supposed to have said to have won this argument, but China maintains monopolies to this very day. It is during this time the Japanese make inventions of paper to write on much faster. They form accurate sundials and clocks. A 365 and one half day calendar and a seismograph to detect earthquakes. Near the end, they realize that having monopolies aren't such a good idea. They go to a more laissez-faire economy. They realize that people um, will work harder if they're motivated, if there are things that they can get and benefit from it. So private ownership begins to happen. And the Han Dynasty is so good, the Confucian scholars work so long, right around the switch from B.C. to A.D., the empire almost fell. But the Confucian scholars were so good they propped it back up. The example I use is how many of the bad principles we had here at Chapel Hill High School. Unfortunately, things get really bad near the end, and not only does the things the emperor try not work, but the barbarians invade, and there's a flood famine, and people are starving. So they think the only way to get rid of the bad stuff is not only to just kill the emperor, but eat him. So this is when they chop up some Wang Mang. Alright? Everybody have fun tonight. Everybody eat some Wang Mang tonight. The other big thing we know that they do is they go hard after the Mongols. They push the Mongols out of China, chase them across the Asian steppes, and they are the snowplow that shoves all those other barbarian groups right toward Rome. All right, so Han Dynasty ends. Next is the Sui Dynasty, Sui Tang Song. 500s, this is the fall of Rome. This is the beginning of the Middle Ages, the darkest part of the Middle Ages in Europe, like Clovis and the Merovingians. This is just a dark, nasty time. Also, Right, right near the end, the Sui Dynasty ends right as Islam is about to be created and burst forth from the Middle East. The Sui Dynasty, after another small period of chaos, returns to a strong central government. And the emperor was kind of a greedy guy. And he has the people dig the Grand Canal, linking southern and northern China. Products from the north can be shipped southward, and products from the south can be shipped north, linking the entire Chinese economy. It remains the longest and largest um, canal dug by pure human labor in world history. Everybody worked on this. And while they were out there slopping away in the muck and the mud, the emperor lived a life of lavish luxury. So while the economy is strengthened, the people are starving. They're busting their butt day to night, and they are starving. It is at this time that Buddhism will spread throughout all of China. 
and it will become deeply rooted. People now connect Buddhism more with China than they do India, but it comes from India. This is the only time where the people actually don't wait for the mandate of heaven. They go out and they actively hunt the emperor and he is assassinated. This is the last time we will see a period of violence for a long time. We're going to do the Tang of the Song Dynasty next. I'm going to ask you guys if you want to take a break. Or you could just do it at will. Is this okay? Do you guys need anything different? All right. All right. Here we go. All right. Tang and Song, two more of the great Hallmark dynasties. Tang and Song, 618 to 907. So the Tang, you are going to think of the heart of the Middle Ages in Europe. Think like Charlemagne. You are going to think the birth and the spread of Islam across the world, Tang Dynasty. You are going to think of the great West African empires, Ghana and Mali, will grow at this time. Forgot the Byzantine Empire in Europe is rocking. Also, at this time, we have the Olmecs and the Mayas over in old Mexico. Mexico. I forgot. We're not interactive. That's right. Thank you, Zach. All right. Also, it is during the Tang and Song Dynasty that Japan begins to borrow a lot of ideas from the Tang and Song and suck them over to Japan. And the Tang will pick up where the Han left off, and they will be an expansionist empire. Manchuria, where we've been talking about the Japanese blew up their own railroad. They will go into Mongolia, deeper into um, Korea. And the empire will get enormous. And once again, the emperor realizes it's too big. It's proximity to authority. It was like the Roman Empire after Trajan went over the Danube River. It's just too big. And warlords out there, Xavier back there, Phoebe over there, Bodhi over there, they think, well, he's too far away. He's not going to come out here and collect taxes, so I'll do what I, what I want. If he comes out, I'll pay, pay him, but I don't think he's coming out here. So the Tang Dynasty is so big, it's almost ungovernable. This is also a unique time where after reunification, after the Sui Dynasty, the Chinese switch their main agricultural crop. They switch from growing wheat, like W-H-E-A-T, wheat, and they begin growing champa rice from Vietnam. Champa rice, you can feed a lot more people with less rice. And you can grow two crops a year. So all of a sudden we have a food surplus which give, gives us a population boom. Right. Now, shortly after the Tang, the Song come in from 960 to, let's say, 1200. And so the Song will see... Things such as um, the uh, Songhai Empire. They will see like the great Zimbabwe and things of that nature. They will see the beginning of the Aztecs in Mexico and the Incas in Peru. All of this is going on during the Song Dynasty. All this stuff is happening. The Crusades are happening. And we're just about to get to the European Renaissance. Everybody getting all that? Am I going too fast with those little going on around the room? All right. Remember, stuff happens laterally. It's laterally. All right. So um, the song make the conscious choice that 
the Tang Empire was just too big, so we're going to consolidate it. We're going to make it smaller, but we are going to govern it better. And along with the Han Dynasty, we have one of the longest periods of peace and prosperity in Chinese history. The Tang and Song are just great periods. Unfortunately, that peace and prosperity will be ended by the Asian crabgrass known as the Mongols. Just when you think you got rid of them all, here they come. But this time they're led by a bad hombre. Little Genghis Khan starts in the early 1200s, and by 1279, his grandson Kubla is knocking on the door. This is the outset of the great Mongol Empire. Both the Tang and the Song were accomplished in all areas, especially culturally and artistically. Landscape painting, showing the deep Chinese connection with nature. And they invent, um, China and Korea battle over this, um, they take wooden blocks, like all oh, the wooden blocks when you stacked as a little kid, they had like ABCs carved into them, and you rolled ink on them, and it was the early version of the printing press. You no longer had to handwrite all that calligraphy, or malligraphy, or phryography, or Reynolds-igraphy. Who else had, or... John, I don't even know. Yours is so transient, it's not even a calligraphy. It's just even more beautiful. Right? It's just gorgeous. So, anyway, this Anna starts laughing. It's all right, Anna. You can laugh. All right, Anna. Anyway, that's okay. All right. So, both were extremely stable. Not a lot of social upheaval. And this is because of the civil service exam. Once that takes root, China, every time they get themselves in trouble, they think, hmm, what would Confucius do? And they really begin to lean on the Confucian scholars. This is the time, remember, that a good Confucian scholar wasn't seen as worthy unless they were fired at least twice for telling the truth. Also, the Silk Road begins to extend. Not only is it going over land, but the Chinese have invented the compass, they've got the stern post rudder, and they are now traveling out into the Indian Ocean. So the Silk Road is not only an overland route, but it is also a water route. It will make it to India and eventually to the east coast of Africa. So the Tang and Song dynasties are actively trading with people of India, they are trading with Muslims and people in East Africa. The Silk Road, I forgot to mention, by the end of the Han Dynasty, the Silk Road runs all the way over to um, Rome. Hang on a second. Bill Malaga. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can I get, can I ask you once, I am in the middle of a big AP review. Hey, hey guys, um, my friend says hello. Um, give me your number, ma'am. 